All right, guys, I don't know. I don't know what what's going on, why we get kicked off. They say it's a copyright uh, thing. <laughs> Allison said they're mean to us. Yeah, that's why. The only thing I could think about. I don't know why. We don't have music playing. We don't have any of that going on, and there's plenty of books online. So I'm just curious why that's happening. We're going to keep our fingers crossed that we get everybody back. Uh, we don't get kicked off again. But if we do get kicked off again, it looks like the only other option we have is uh, for me to go to my other channel. But what happens there is a lot of you guys are restricted there because uh, I think that it's not a school account, my other one. So you, if we get kicked off again, that's where we're going just so we can get a video done. But if you can't get on, maybe have mom and dad uh, sit with you for 20 minutes or so or at least log on for you. And uh, you don't go just perusing the internet uh, without them being around, but at least they can uh, get get you uh, uh, so you can watch it. Otherwise, it'll be restricted. I think. Again, I'm not Kaba savvy, so I love YouTube live live. But uh, if it's not going to work, we got to get something done. So we'd rather you be here than not be here. What does copyright mean? It means that we're uh, we're stealing information from people, which which we're doing a, a live book read, and. The, the companies of that, of that book company, you know, doesn't want us to do a live read, but we're not making it a public share. We're not advertising it. And we have 60 of these books that we purchased back in the classroom that we'd be reading. So it's a good thing that we're reading the book for the school. Normally you'd have it in front of you. Uh, I don't know if somebody catches it. I don't know who's watching. I have no idea how that works. Uh, if they're saying, oh, we can't be doing a live read of, of a book. Not every kid bought. The thing is, we did every did every kid did buy them. We do have well, not every kid, but the school district bought them for you. We have a whole class set. We have two class sets back at Cherokee. So that's what copyright means. You don't want to. Uh, you can't listen to music. You can't play music without it. The person who actually produced the music getting credit for it. So that's really what it comes down to. You got to be careful with those kinds of things. And again, we would never do it if it was just a one-time thing, but we own Wonder. We own Tuck Everlasting. We own Esperanza Horizon. We own Chasing Lincoln's Killer. So these are all books that have been purchased. Uh, and that's what it comes down to. We're not looking to advertise me reading this book and trying to, to a million subscribers. So it's not going to hurt book sales. So that's really what it comes down to. But we made it, what, two minutes now? The last video made it four minutes. So listen. I don't have a good feeling because last time we got kicked off, they kept kicking us, kicking us off. But if we do, remember, I'm going to go to the last, my other's page, and uh, we'll go from there. That's all we could do. Yeah. I don't know. Is somebody humming a song? I don't know. Maybe my voice sounds like music. You know how beautiful it is? Or raspy. Maybe that's why they thought, thought I was singing. Who knows? I, I, I mean, who was even listening two minutes in, three minutes into a video? With uh, fifth graders. So I don't know what YouTube is doing. I'll have to, again, I haven't got an answer from them yet. I've, I've emailed them several times. Okay, so we're going to try to get started. We're going to keep our fingers crossed that we can get through it. Uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, I wanted to go over the science too with you guys. I just don't know if I want to take that time now to do it. But uh, science, I, I talked to a couple of you. Most of you finished it in 10, 15 minutes which is good is what you should have did. A couple of you took a little bit longer and I'm just not sure what you were doing, why it took long uh, once you understood the steps. And if you didn't understand the steps, you got to you gotta reach out to me and let me know. I had great uh, FaceTime calls with kids today, uh, helping them understand it. That's what we're here for. I have no problem answering your questions that way as long as it saves you a headache and it doesn't take you six hours to do things. I don't want you doing that either. Yesterday, my one of my children was doing homework for from like nine to three. And I just thought it was too long. So today I had to, you know, step in and make some arrangements. I'm a dad too. I get it. We don't need to be doing sitting in front of the computer for six hours, guys, please. Two, three hours at most in the morning. Or if you want to do it in the afternoon, that's plenty. You don't need any more than that. Don't drive yourself crazy. No, Christian, you can't use names more than once. I don't think so. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now there's 20 names, 20 names. Each one gets its own name. So if you did that, you did something wrong, which is fine. You know, if, as long as you started every single, like I said, alien one, you have to start with question one, alien two, you have to start with question one, alien three, you had to start with question one, 
Alien 4, you had to start with question one. Are you getting my point? Alien 20, you had to start with question one. And you just eliminate one by one until you get your names. That's all you had to do. As long as you started every single alien off with the chart, question one, and then went from there, you would have been fine. Well, then, yeah, listen, is it possible you made a mistake? Yes. It was a little confusing because this right here, where is it? I'm moving the pen the wrong way. That's a star. These things here on the side, their legs, where you thought it, maybe it was their body, these are their legs. And all this stuff in the middle, those are spikes. Those are hair, the spiky hairs they were talking about. See, the sides, all their sides are legs. Those are the legs. So that might have confused you. But it's all right. Listen, it was really meant to be fun. I wanted you to have fun doing it. You know, tomorrow, I'm not tomorrow, Monday, we're going to be going into cells a little bit. I'm going to give you a quiz on this. And uh, use whatever notes you want. I don't really care. Just want to see where your mind is, at least that you understand it. And then we're going to break it into uh, cells. And uh, we're going to have some fun with that. But classification is really kind of a fun topic. We do a lot more fun in the uh, classroom, but we weren't able to do it. So we did, we try to make, I try to find as many fun activities as I could uh, for you guys. And, you know, today I thought I enjoyed the, the alien mystery one. I don't know. If, I mean, I'm a little geeky, but, you know, that's how it goes. All right. We're seven minutes in. Hoping for the best. This is where we get excited. I said this chapter, forget about the whole thing. In the next 13 pages, our journey is going to be complete. So how it ends is anyone's guess right now. Christian, the stuff is due whenever it's done. Can I? Is that easier for you? Whenever you get things done, you can hand them in. It might come up, oh, so-and-so handed this in late. I put a due date on there. That doesn't mean that you have to get it in there. I'm not marking it late. Get it in. When you're done, you're done. And I can live with that. And uh, so don't panic about it. Sometimes if you have nothing to do Saturday, Sunday, you might want to wait and do some of the math then. It was 40 40 or 50 questions today. You might want to just chill out and do a little bit now, a little bit later. I don't care when it's done. All right. I'm, I'm going to spend the weekend. What I do on the weekend is I'm going to grade your week's work. And I'm going to make a little bit of a chart for myself as a teacher. Where did you struggle? Did you nail everything? Did you seem to get everything going good? Who needs review? Uh, excuse me, review. Who's ready to move on? And that's how we're going to do it. So instead of me planning and getting my kids in school, like I do Monday through Friday on Saturday, Sunday, my kids are off. They'll read. That's it. But I'll spend the time grading all the work that you handed in. So if you get me all the work by the weekend, that's great. Mr. Calvin, I didn't get everything in. That's okay. We'll be fine. So don't panic about any of that. Okay, guys. Bobby, you've been great. Keep up the good work. I'm very happy with you. Don't stress anything. And again, you're not, you don't need to be a hundred. You're, you're not a great. You're uh, you're much more than that. And we'll, we'll go from that. I was talking to Mr. Johnson yesterday about uh, this is a new, new form of teaching. But at the same point, it's been really, really cool uh, getting to know you like this and listening. Even though you're only typing, everyone's getting their own voice. And I'm hearing everybody's question. And maybe some of you are more comfortable even typing it than you are asking it in class. Or you, you, you don't, you're afraid to ask it. And I think that you're finding out that your questions are very valid and we're enjoying it. And I'm enjoying our relationship this way. Obviously, I enjoy seeing you a lot more. But this has been pretty cool experience. Uh, getting to know you this way. And it's been a lot of us during these read alouds have been great. So hopefully uh, we're going to keep it going no matter what. All right, guys. Uh, so Booth was staying at the Garrett's. Everything was great until he started showing some suspicious behavior. He started to, to, to get nervous when people rode by the house and people walked up the block. He used to get my guns. And so now the Garrett's, the dad had went on business and left for the night. So he's left with his son. The son is like, you know, 25 years old. He's not a kid. But the son began getting suspicious. Him and his brother were suspicious of his behavior. So he said, listen, we don't want you in the house anymore. You can't stay here anymore. You have to go and you have to leave. They said, listen, can we at least stay underneath the deck? He, he can't stay underneath the deck because the dogs sleep there. Can I, can you, 
Can we sleep in the in the barn house? Yes, you could sleep in the barn house. So when they went to the barn house, actually it was a tobacco house. When they went in for bed, they went in and behind them, they locked them in. Booth and Harold have no idea that they're locked in. The Garrett's didn't do that because they're going to tell the army or the cavalry where they were. They did it because they were fearful that Booth and Harold would wake up in the middle of the night and steal the horses. So that's really why they did it. Don't think the Garrett's were this. Oh, we're going to create the greatest booby trap of all time. Not the case. Okay. So listen, enough with the science now. Well, uh, Adonis, your question, I'll take a look again, make sure that maybe, maybe I missed something wrong, but if so, it's all right. We'll move on. We're moving on just to chasing Lincoln's killer now. All right, guys, here we go. At 11 o'clock PM, that same night, the Calvary patrol approached Bowling Green. They surrounded the Star Hotel, expecting to find Willie Jett inside. Remember, Willie Jett was one of the soldiers that was with Booth and Harold when they crossed the river. The owner of the house led the soldiers to a second-story bedroom. Prepared for anything, the officer and detectives rushed in and discovered Willie. They seized him, hustled him downstairs roughly, and confirmed him in the parlor. Confined him in the parlor. Held him there. He couldn't go anywhere. Doherty, Baker, and Conger worked on Jet, trying to frighten him. Conger asked, where are the two men who came with you across the river at Port Royal? Jet immediately betrayed John Wilkes Booth. I know who you want, and I will tell you where they can be found. He revealed the fugitives were at Richard Garrett's farmhouse and agreed to show the soldiers where they were. Without Jet's help, it might be difficult, almost impossible, to locate Garrett's farm in the middle of the night. Seize means they took them. They grabbed them. To seize something means to take. Okay? So they have Jet. They scare him. He said, listen, I'll tell you everything. I know exactly where he is. He's at the Garrett. He's at the Garrett's farm. I could show you where the house is. So the government's like, you got it. Lead away, my friend. So what Booth thought was the great thing, running into the soldiers, turns out to be the worst thing that could have happened because now more people knew where he was and that means more mouths could talk. And this mouth right here, Jet, is the mouth that's going to get him. So unfortunately, it wasn't a good thing that he met those soldiers, even though we thought at the time it was, as did he. It was day 12. At about 12.30 a.m., the 16th New York Cavalry headed for Garrett's farm and they hoped the capture of Lincoln's assassin. Once at the front gate at the Garrett Farm, a charge was ordered. The 16th New York Cavalry raised up the dirt road toward the farmhouse. The Garrett's dogs heard the noise first, the sound of metal touching metal, of 100 hooves sending vibrations through the earth. On watch, John and William Garrett heard it too. The barking of the dogs and the clanking metal sounds finally woke Booth. Recognizing the unique music of Cavalry on the move, the assassin knew he had only a minute or two to react before it was too late. So Booth hears it. He hears the cavalry coming. What do you think he's going to do? What do you think he's going to do? He's going to run to the door to get out. What's the problem with that plan? He's locked in the farm. He can't get out. So that's got to be a scary feeling for Booth, knowing, exactly guys, exact good, knowing that they're coming and he has no way out. The cavalry is here, Booth hissed as he awoke Harold. They snatched up their weapons and rushed to the front of the barn, where they discovered the door was locked. The Garrett's had imprisoned them. Booth tried to pry the lock from its mountings. They had to flee immediately before the Union troops could surround them. They scampered to the back wall of the barn and tried to kick out a board so they could crawl out. With Booth's injured leg, even working together, he and Harold could not dislodge a board, so they could not escape into the woods. The Union column raced up the road and surrounded the farmhouse. Edward Doherty, Luther Baker, and Everton Conger dropped from their saddles, leaped up onto the porch, and pounded on the door. 
Richard Garrett climbed from his bed and walked downstairs in his night clothes. In the tobacco bar, David Harold panicked. You had better give up, he urged Booth. David Harold don't want to die. He don't want to die. And David Harold is kind of thinking, wait, you know, you killed the president. I didn't kill the president. So you don't be getting no gunfight. We have to give up. That's our only way out of this. You think Booth's going to give up, guys? Let's find out. No, no, the actor insisted. I will suffer death first. Conger demanded of Richard Garrett. Where are the two men who stopped here at your house? Garrett turned out to be very reluctant to reveal Booth and Harold's whereabouts. Even the threat of hanging did not move Richard Garrett to reveal where the prey was hiding. Then Doherty seized John Garrett and put a revolver to his head, ordering him to tell where the assassins were. So Garrett was kind of like, I don't know where he is. I don't know where he is. Because they didn't, I don't know if it was because they didn't want to betray Booth. I don't know if it's because they didn't want to be connected to it. No one knows really why. So what they did is they took a gun to his son's head and said, where is he? You can't do that. You can't, you can't do that. However, they did. They did. So they had a gun now. The cavalry has a gun to John Garrett's head. He's in the barn, he revealed. They are in the tobacco barn. The soldiers rushed to surround the barn. Baker ordered John Garrett to enter the barn and take the weapons from the fugitives. John had seen Boots' weapons and knew he would not hesitate to take revenge for his family's inhospitality and betrayal. So they want John, now the guy who kicked them out to say sleep in the barn, they want him to go into the barn and say, listen, Calvary's here. I need to take your weapons from you. Not a good idea. And John says, no, he would not be the assassin's last victim. Baker explained that the mission was not optional. If he did not go to the barn, Baker would burn all of Garrett's property. He would end this affair with a bonfire and a shooting match. Baker unlocked the barn door, opened it a little with Booth invisible just a few yards away. He clutched his pistols tightly, but held his fire. Baker seized John Garrett and half guided him, half pushed him through the door and closed it behind him. So now John Garrett's in the barn with Booth and Harold. John Garrett urged Booth, still hidden in the dark, to give himself up. Like a ghostly vision, John Wilkes Booth's pale, haunting face emerged from the darkness as his voice explored. Darn you, you have betrayed me. If you don't get out of here, I will shoot you. Get out of this barn at once. The assassin reached behind his back for one of his revolvers. A terrified John Garrett turned and ran, escaping the barn. Finally, at the climax of a 12-day manhunt, they had gripped the nation. A heavily armed patrol, the 16th New York Cavalry, had cornered Lincoln's assassin. Surprisingly, instead of ordering the men to rush the barn and take Booth, they first sent an unarmed civilian to disarm him. When that scheme failed, they attempted to talk him out of the barn. The government doesn't want Booth dead. They just want him, they want him captured. They know if they run in there to try to get him, they're going to end up shooting him and killing him because he's going to be shooting. The soldiers are going to shoot back. So they want to try to talk him out so he can stand trial. That's what they want. They want a big trial for the world to see. Even though you know he's going to get hanged if he goes to trial, they, they want in front of everybody. They want to make sure justice is served. With that scheme, actually, why didn't 20 armor? Surely the honor of capturing Lincoln's assassin was worth the risk of a few casualties. Baker shouted an ultimatum to the fugitives. I want you to surrender. If you don't, I will burn this barn down in 15 minutes. So they said, listen, if you're not going to come out, we're going to set the barn on fire, which will make you come out or you'll burn to death. You decide. That's the plan right now. 
Boots stepped to the front of the barn and peered through a space between two boards, examining the manhunters. Who are you? What do you want? Whom do you want? And I was going to pretend maybe I'm going to pretend like I'm not John Wilkes Booth. We want you, Baker replied, and we know who you are. Give up your arms and come out. Booth continued to stall, asking for time to make a decision. Baker agreed to the delay. Harold decided to give himself up. He thought he could talk his way out of trouble and just go home. Harold was like, I had it. I'm surrendering. And I'm going to just say, listen, guys, I helped Booth get across. I had nothing to do with killing anybody. Can I go home? Can I go home to where I live and, and, and live a good life? You think the government's letting him go? <laughs> That's how they spoke, Bobby. Whom? Whom is a, is, a, is a proper English word. In his mind, he wasn't guilty of anything. Booth had shot Lincoln. Powell had stabbed Seward. And he had just been along for the ride. He was innocent. He did nothing wrong, David Harold. Booth, however, refused to let Harold go. Harold pleaded with Booth, begging to be released. Finally, Booth relented, denouncing his companion. You coward. Go, go, if you must. Harold had stood by Booth, even when he had no chance to leave. Even when he had a chance to leave. He had rendered loyal service. It was harsh to call him a coward now. Harold turned away from Booth and faced the door. He thrust one empty hand at a time through the doorframe to show that he was not armed. When the soldiers could see them, Doherty sprung to the door, seized Harold by the wrist, and yanked him through the doorway. He frisked him to make sure he was unarmed, and like a schoolmaster taking a disobedient student by the collar, marched him away from the barn. Now that remained, now all that remained was John Wilkes Booth. Still at bay and armed, for Booth, this was his final and greatest performance. Not just for the small audience of soldiers at Garrett's barn, but for all of history. It's true, guys. This happened in 1865. We're in 2020, and we're reading it. His performance is still living on. Years and years and years later, centuries later. Here's a picture of the barn. It wasn't, you know, it was a drawing is a better way to put it. Almost, almost there, guys. He had already committed the most daring public murder in American history. Indeed, he had performed it fully staged before an audience at Ford's Theater. Tonight, he would script his own end with a performance that equaled his triumph at Ford's. Baker and Conger argued against waiting until morning to take Booth. In a few hours, the light of dawn would illuminate the manhunters and make them into perfect visible targets. Booth could hardly miss one of Doherty's ser ser sergeants. Boston Colbert volunteered for a suicide mission. He would slip into the barn alone and fight Booth one-on-one. -on -one. Three times Corbett volunteered. Each time Doherty ordered Corbett back to his position. So this guy, Boston Corbett, was like, listen, let me go in there. Me against him. One-on-one. -on -one. I'll take him out. And they kept saying, no, you can't do it. Now, you could say Boston Corbett, an American hero. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe he was an ego. Maybe he was like, I'll take this guy on. I want to be remembered as the guy that took him out. I know I can take him out. And let's not forget, Boots got a bad ankle. And Boots an actor. He's not a fighter. Boston Corbett is a soldier. So it seemed like Boston was like, I, I'm going to take this guy. I can beat this guy. I know, like a time travel. I agree. Conger and Baker had another plan. They wanted to burn the barn down. The flames and smoke would do the job of flushing Booth out without harm to the men. Conger ordered the Garrett sons to collect a few armfuls of straw and pile them against the side of the barn. The rustling sounds alerted Booth, who rushed to the site of the noise. He ordered the Garretts to move away from the barn or he would shoot them. They quickly retreated out of pistol range. 
anticipating the barn was about to be burnt down, Boo challenged all of his pursuers to honorable combat on open ground. He had just challenged 26 men, a lieutenant, and two detectives to a duel. Baker declined the offer. Well, my brave boys, prepare a stretcher for me, Booth replied merrily. Conga bent over and lit the straw. The pine twigs and straw burst into flames that licked the dry, weathered boards. Soon the barn caught fire, and within minutes, the corner of the barn blazed brightly. The fire cast a yellow-orange glow that flickered eerily across the faces of the soldiers. Booth could see them clearly now, but he held his fire. So now the barn's going up in flames, and Booth's inside, and it's lighting up the outside. And through the slats and the boards, he could see the 26 people. Do you think he could take them all out? Does he have a chance to take them all out? As the fire grew, it lit the inside of the barn. So for the first time, for the first time, the soldiers could also see their quarry in the gaps between the slats. The assassin had three choices. Stay in the barn and burn alive. Not a good choice. Blow his shoot himself. Or script his own honorable end by hobbling out the front door and doing battle with the manhunters, welcoming death but risking capture. Booth decided it was better to die than to be taken to Washington to face justice. He did not wish to bear the spectacle of a trial that would put him on public display for the amusement of the press and curiosity seekers. Nor did he wish to endure the rituals of a hanging. Being bound and blindfolded, parading past his own coffin and open grave, climbing the steps of the scaffold, the shameful death of a common criminal was not for him. No, this stage actor was going to go out in glory. It was far better to die here. Boots stood in the corner of the barn, awkwardly balancing the carbine in one hand and a pistol in the other. So he's ready for battle, guys. There's another picture of the barn. Catching flames. Booth inside, you see him here. Crutch under one arm, measuring how quickly the flames were engulfing him. He hopped forward, the carbine in his right hand, the butt plate balanced against his hip. Outside the barn, Conger, Baker, Doherty, and the cavalry tensed for action. No one could endure the hot flames and choking smoke for long. They expected the door to swing open at any moment and see Booth emerge with his hands up or his pistols blazing. Boston Colbert, the guy who wanted to go one-on-one -on -one with him, watched the assassin's every move inside the barn. Unseen by Booth, he walked up to one side of the barn and peeked between one of the gaps in the barn walls. As the flames grew brighter, Colbert could see his prey clearly. The sergeant watched Booth and drew his pistol. Booth leveled the carbine against his hip as though preparing to bring it to a firing position. Corbett poked the barrel of his revolver through the slit in the wall, aimed at Booth, and fired. Bang! The soldiers heard one shot. Instantly, Booth dropped the carbine and crumpled to his knees. Like sprinters cued by a starting gun, Baker rushed into the barn with Conger at his heels. Conger seized the assassin's pistols. They lifted Booth from the floor, carried him under the trees a few yards from the door, and laid him on the grass. Though unable to move, Booth opened his eyes and attempted to speak. Conger called for water, pulled a little into Booth's mouth, and he spit it out. The assassin could not swallow. He was completely paralyzed. Another picture of this is where Boots getting shot right there. You see the shooter over here. For the first time in his life, the great actor was at a loss for words. His voice was silenced by the bullet that had quickly passed through his neck and through his spinal column. 
After several attempts at speaking, Booth whispered, Tell my mother I died for my country. It was hard to hear his faint voice above the roar of the flames, the shouts of the men, and the snorting of the horses. Tell my mother I died for my country. That would be his final words. As the blaze in the barn grew to an inferno, the soldiers retreated to the garret house, moving Booth's limp body onto the porch near the bench where Booth had sat, smoked, napped, and chatted over the precious few days. Blood seeped from the entry and exit wounds in his neck and pulled under his head, staining the floorboards. Doherty brought David Harold to the porch, bound his hands, and tied him to a tree about two yards from where Booth lay. Harold would have a front row seat for the climax of the chase for Lincoln's killer. Booth suffered extreme pain whenever he was moved. You could tell by his eyes he was begging, just kill me, kill me, because he was in pain. Put me out of my misery. Congo whispered to him, we don't want to kill you. We want you to get well. He was sincere. They wanted Booth alive so they can bring him back to Washington as a prize for Edmund Stanton. We want you to suffer. Stanton and others were certain Booth was merely an agent of a Confederate conspiracy. Following the swearing in of Andrew Johnson at the 17th president, Stanton had issued a reward for Jefferson Davis and other Confederate officials, naming them as assassin conspirators, though they weren't, but they assumed that this was a bigger plan by the South. It wasn't, but that's what the government thought at the time. Two other captured conspirators, Michael O'Loughlin and Sam Arnold, had already confessed everything they knew about the plot. If Booth talked to, he might reveal valuable information that implicated the highest officials in the Confederacy. So A, they want Booth alive because they want to see if he has any information that could get higher people up the chain up to Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederacy. They wanted information on all of them. Booth acted alone. Booth was the highest it goes. There was nobody telling Booth what to do. Booth made the plan. But at the time, they thought it was someone else. You're right, Kara, RIP. It's sad, I don't care, good, bad. It's hard hearing anyone dying. It is hard. But because of someone under Congress command, it was obvious Booth was not going back to Washington alive. Who fired that shot? Conger demanded to know. Boston Corbett came forward, snapped to attention, saluted Conger and proclaimed that he had shot Booth and Providence had directed him to do it. He claimed he opened fire because he thought Booth was going to shoot the soldiers. He did it to protect the lives of his fellow troopers. In fact, the men of the 16th New York had not been ordered to hold their fire. Conger, Baker, and Doherty had failed to give them any orders at all on the subject. As a non-commissioned officer, Corbett exercised his own discretion and shot Booth. A local, a local doctor was summoned. He examined Booth, who lapsed in and out of consciousness. He proclaimed the wound was mortal. I mean, he would die from it. Much like Booth's gunshot wound to Lincoln was mortal. Booth would not recover. Conger rifled through Boots' pockets, then placed the contents in a handkerchief. Boots' diary, money, keys, compass, small knife, and tobacco would be taken to Stanton as treasure and evidence. My hands, Booth whispered. Baker raised them for both Booth to see. For the last time, John Wilkes Booth saw the hands, now helpless, that he had slain Abraham Lincoln with. Gathering his remaining strength, he looked at his hands and spoke his last words. Useless. Useless. Boots' lips turned purple and his throat swelled up. He gasped. The rising sun nudged above the horizon and colored the eastern sky, flooding the garret farm with light, which shone on Boots' face. The stage grew dark for him. His body shuddered. John Wilkes Booth was dead. The 12-day chase for Abraham Lincoln's assassin was over. There's Boston Colbert. That's the man 
that shot John Wilkes Booth. I tell you, you, you can't get more criminal than JWB. It's hard to read that and not feel some kind of sadness. You know, so I know it's crazy. I, why would I feel sadness for someone who killed the president, who was evil, who, you know, it just, you, you hate hearing anybody suffer. You know, honestly, uh, I, that's me. Some of you might be saying good riddance. I, listen, me too. I will say it. It's just hearing about it, reading the words. It's a little, you get a little bit sad for anyone going through that kind of pain. You don't wish that, you know, quick death. You know, that's if you wish on anybody, you don't want anyone to have to suffer. But somebody said, yeah, you know what? He deserved to suffer. Um, it's not my way. It's not my way. I know he should have been brought to justice and I know that he deserved what he got. I'm a quick suffer kind of guy. I don't want anyone to have any kind of pain in their life. It's just not how I operate. This is mom or shit. I would. Julie, it's funny you say that because. No matter what my kids do. I'll always love them no matter what. Am I going to be happy with their decision? Am I going to be disappointed if they do something crazy like that? You're, you're, you're forever ruined as a parent, but you can't not love your kid. So does his mom love him? Yeah, she loves him. Sure. One of his last words was, tell my mom. It was about his mother. So yeah, she loved him. And I'm sure his brother loved him. I'm sure, I'm sure they're not happy with him. Why would you do this to the family name? Why would you do this? But if you ask them deep down in their hearts, do they love their brother or their son? Yes, I, I, I can't answer for them. I can answer for me. You know, you could be heartbroken. You could be angry with your family, with decisions they make. But deep down, if you have a real family, I mean, at least my family, and I fight with my brother all the time. My older brother and I would fist fight every day of our lives. Now we're old. We don't do it anymore. But I always loved them. Always. They didn't always like them, but I always loved them. That's the end of the chapter. Yeah. Chapter ending. One final picture of J, JWB. I think I'm going to grow a mustache like that when I come back. What do you think, guys? Little JWB tribute mustache. I love Adonis, the avenging of Lincoln. Uh, Julia, I'm going to talk, take Julia's question. Does his mom know? Does his mom know about this? His mom does know. Mom eventually found out. Unconditional love. Ava, mwah, great answer. It's exactly what it's called. Dogs have it. Dogs have unconditional love. They love you no matter what. But you're, for your children, you have it. Ask any of your parents to tell you the same thing. At the end of the chapter, if they kept the president alive for longer, why didn't they keep Booth alive? They didn't keep the president alive. It was just until he could, you know, there's nothing that could be done. It was a matter of time until the body gave out. And that's both of them had that. It was a matter of time before the both their bodies just stopped working. They, nobody really kept anybody alive. And remember, there was nothing that could be done. Maybe they took the swelling of Lincoln's brain by removing some of the gook in the back. But Booth, there was nothing they could do. He was, he was mortal. The doctor looked at him, says there's nothing they're going to do. He's, he's paralyzed. He's going to die. Yes, Lincoln is avenged. Uh, I wonder what would ha happen if Lincoln... Dean, I ask this question all the time. More with John F. Kennedy. I'm a big John F. Kennedy guy. I love JFK, uh, who was also assassinated in 1963. But I think about it with Lincoln, too. Yeah, what would happen if Lincoln wasn't killed? You know, it's one of those questions we'll never, unfortunately never know the answer to. But I, I guarantee the world would have been even better. Maybe it would have transformed even quicker than it was. But unfortunately, we'll never know the answer to that question. You know, Lincoln's gone. Kennedy's gone. Robert Kennedy's gone. Martin Luther King Jr. is gone. All these great people, unfortunately. And we'll never know what the world would be like if they had lived out their life. Yes, Lincoln Avenge. Is that the end of the book? Not the end of the book. Uh, I'm going to tell you what's coming next. Ava, read more. Does everyone get out of jail now? That's a great question, Christian. I'm going to talk about that now. I love Adonis. Adonis, there's something about you that makes you so cut and dry, right and wrong. There's no middle, and I love that about you. You are who you are. I agree. I'm not telling you I feel bad that he's dead. I'm just saying I feel bad when people, anybody suffer. At least I can't watch it or I can't hear it. 
It's just whatever happened, happened. I'm better off not knowing. But yeah, you none of us should feel bad for John Wilkes Booth, including Mr. Kavanaugh. However, I'm just telling you, not so much John Wilkes Booth hearing about anybody suffering is is hard for me to hear. So that's what I mean by that. Uh, does everyone get out of jail is a great question. On Monday, we're going to talk about what happens to everybody that was put in jail. So basically, you're going to get like, what happened to this, 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 and this. So I'm going to tell you what happened to everybody. And that's going to be Monday. And we'll fit that's the end of the book on Monday. And then Nearpods, uh, we're going to do a, a fun and amazing ultimate challenge, time to climb, chasing Lincoln's killer. It'll be ultimate. I want to see who is the all-knowing Chasing Lincoln's killer. I got a couple of guesses who I think is going to win. Feel the grit. <laughs> Don is your no joke. Uh, we don't, uh, Isabella, I would lie. I got 75 books about JFK right now. I love, I could talk about JFK all day. There's not a book like this about JFK, unfortunately. But JFK, to me, was a great president. Uh, that's just because I'm, I'm Irish, though, too. So he, he has a lot in common with my family, uh, just their upbringing. Are we going to read a book about JFK now? Are we going to read that book? We're not reading anything about Adonis. It's Kavanaugh, you have to feel the grip. <laughs> you're right. Adonis, you're right, man. I'm not going to argue with you. In the same, who do you think? I'm not telling you who I think is going to win, but that's pretty much it. So uh, I want to just check real quick. Uh, I, I hope, did you guys, are you guys enjoying the book? Did you enjoy it? Is it fun? People told me, like other teachers said, oh, I don't read it. It's not fun. My kids don't like it. I'm like, what? You, how do they not like the book? It's unbelievable. But that's me. I, I, I see you guys loving this book, in my opinion. So I just think maybe you got to read it with passion, I tell those teachers. Got to read it. I think it's better when it's read to you, too. I think you can get real excited when it's read to you. Somebody said there's two of the same names. Let me see. There's two. They're close. But no, there's 20 different names on the science. 20. So if you got back to doubles... Put them, post them on the science site, and I'll double check it for you. See which way you made your mistake. That's that. Okay. Are we doing Nearpods besides? Uh, yes, because Monday's the last day of, of the Nearpods for the class. You're going to like this, by the way. When when all the Nearpods are done, when everybody's presented, I'm going to give everybody, I'm going to give a list of everybody's code, and you can go back to anybody's Nearpod that you want. You're gonna you're gonna have access to them forever. So if you want to go in and 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 learn about lines again, you want to do D Disney World again, you want to do Spike Ball again, you want to do the Whale again, you want to do Zodiac signs again. You're gonna have the ability to go into Nearpod and do them whenever you want. So if you missed any Nearpods and you want to see what they're about, you're gonna get the codes for everybody's. So I'm gonna give out a class list, and you're gonna be able to visit all those. But they're done on Monday. We have three left. Get those three done. You've been phenomenal with them. I've been loving it. Tuesday will be my Nearpod. Wednesday, my son did a Nearpod that he wants you guys to do. You don't have to do any of these. If you want to do them, you can. So Monday, we're going to finish the book. Tuesday is going to be the Nearpods. And we're going to do a clip. It's at 4 o'clock on Tuesday. We're going to do just a group talk. No new book on Tuesday. Wednesday, we start our new book. Yes, Isabel, you're Monday. Uh, you don't, Christian, hand in the science when it's done. Everything that you do should be handed in, but don't hand it in before it's done. Ah, Dean, don't you wish you knew? I don't tell you the new book until I show you the cover. I'll show you the cover Tuesday afternoon after our talk. Uh, some of you may have read it already. I love it. And, uh, but again, I'm going to read it to you. And I'm going to add some, uh, you know, I do the voices a li little bit more fun. So we'll, we'll have some fun with it. You don't get the science, Christian? Christian, if you don't get the science, have mom or dad uh, call me, FaceTime me, and, I'll, and I'll, it'll take you seven seconds to understand once I show it to you. So if you're worried about it, that goes for anybody. If you're not sure, if you can't get the science, it's confusing you. Have someone call me. It'll take me two seconds to explain it to you. All right? 
You're not going to watch any of Bonzo. Julia, you will. You No doubt about it, you will. I do not do one every time. Just want the number of the amp. I did not do one every time. I just went with them. No, see, Isabel, that's that's wrong. If you if you went to Alien fourteen and started on question fourteen, you failed. You failed. It's that simple. Every alien has to start with number one. Every alien starts with number one, and you'll be you'll blow through the assignment. What I recommend that you do though is you print this page out. Print the alien faces out, have it here, and leave this sheet on the computer and just read it one by one. Start with step one every time. Start with step one every single time. So even if it's alien 13, you don't start on number 13. You start at number one, and then you go through. You think you understand that now, Christian and Isabella? Does that make more sense? I would do it again, Isabella. So if you've already submitted it, hit unsubmit. And then you can do it again. All right. I hate that it's the weekend. Uh, not, you know, normally, you know, you guys love the weekend. But you know, I kind of, I'm a TGIM kind of guy. I'm a thank God it's Monday. By the way, I shaved my head again. See how short it got? I like it. Actually, I like it short. I even went shorter this time. I like it. But uh, I'm a TGIM. Thank God it's Monday. Because of you guys. I love seeing you guys. And. The fact that we're not going to see each other until Monday, or at least you see me and I know you see me. I'm looking forward to, uh, Dean, I don't know what you did wrong. I uh, uh, Should have called me, dude. Would have taken you 10 minutes. Stop trying to be a hero. I can help you if you need help. That's what I'm here for. Ask Julia. Julia Ferriola called. We did it on FaceTime. She was done in 10 minutes, she said. I'm here to help you. Anytime you want. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right, guys. Have a great weekend. You should always read, guys. I, you should be reading every single day. You shouldn't need me to tell you. Read every day. Read every day. I'm reading every day. Not just this book. I got four books that I'm reading right now. Three of them are sport books. I got to start changing my genre. I got to find something new. So I'm going to be doing chess today. With my children that learn to chess, I'm not a good chess player. But I'm going to try to get better so I can beat some of you guys when I come back to class. But that's it. All right, guys. I bid you a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Be good to your mom and dad, grandpa, grandparents. Clean your rooms. Make your bed every single day. I want to show you something before I go. Every day, look at me. This is my son, my first grade son's list that he has to do. See what it's in the first one? It says, eat breakfast and make bed. Out of all these things he has to do as assignments, the hardest one for him to do is make his bed. No matter what, you wake up, you make your bed. Deal. Promise me. Promise me. Have a great weekend.